how God can use one life at a time. Your life, my life, Elmer's life, every life committed to Jesus. It's amazing to me what Jesus can do with one life. Now, last summer, Elmer did his tour through Oklahoma and Texas. He came back so excited he told me, Pastor, I could have read the phone book and somebody would get saved. That was a fact. Yeah. Everywhere he went, he had pastors call him from his previous engagement to talk about the results, what happened during his presentation, but also after he left town. The Spirit of God continued to move. Yes. And Elmer won't tell you, but God has used him for revivals in the United States and around the world when he was ministering in Fiji at the Fiji Revival. During his presentation of Jesus, it was aired in Israel. And was it 1,500? 1,500 special forces in training in Israel listened to the presentation and gave their life to Jesus. Wow. The generals were, at, they were, they were fortunately born again Christians. They were uh, able to help lead their men into the Lord. It was, a, it was a revival that was unbelievable. Yeah. Born again generals. How wonderful. Leading their troops to Jesus. Well, amidst all that's going on today in our world, and I'm talking about the confusion that's in the world. And I'm talking about the desperation in the world. I'm talking about the fear that's in the world and the multiple deceptions going on in our day. The man and woman empowered with the truth of God will remove all those deceptions and confusions and fears, you name it. The truth has a way of overpowering every obstacle and every enemy of God. I'm presenting to you today the truth. It's not an ideology. The truth is a man named Jesus. And everything that proceeds from his mouth has the power of the truth behind it. Now later I'll refer to my little board here. Um, so far I'll bet I'm the only one that understands it. It looks like a lot of confusion. But if you want to find the truth, this is called the word of truth. And when you feed on the word of truth, something happens in you by the virtue of the Spirit of God who is called the Spirit of Truth who will lead and guide you into all truth. It's a miracle how the words on these pages become alive in a believer by the virtue and power of the Spirit of Truth. And people have been searching to make sense for years. Jesus said this in John 16, 37. He's addressing Pilate and he says, I was born for this. I came into the world for this cause, to bear witness of the truth. Yes. You see, when Jesus stepped into the world, so did the truth. Yes. Uh, uh. And so Pilate has a question. What is truth? Now, I don't know how he said that. I don't know why he picked his words. Uh, did he desire to know the truth? Hmm. Was he being sarcastic? Was he mocking? Did he show contempt with his irony? Was it a, a question of ridicule? Or was it life's 
hopelessness asking a question. Did he say it out of despair? Did Pilate, like so many, lose hope that there was even the remotest chance to know the truth? Boy, in today's world, everybody's got their version of truth. It can't all be truth. Today we think the truth is kind of relative. Well, what's true for me is true for me, and what's true for you is true for you, but that's not truth. That's glorified opinion. You know why I think Pilate said what is truth? I think he was under tension. I think Pilate was extremely uncomfortable standing before the truth. You see, the truth requires that we do some self-examination to see how we measure up to the truth. When I was a child, I had this great imagination. I was looking for something. All children have hope that they're going to find something, that there'll be this treasure open, and they're going to find this treasure, that somehow they're going to learn something, and children have this wonderful capacity for light. They have this great, great propensity to know more. And so, being a child, I was fascinated when I heard a cricket sing this song. Get the encyclopedia, E-N-C-Y-C-L-O-P-E-D-I-A. Get the encyclopedia, E-N-C-Y-C-L-O-P-E-D-I-A. Jiminy Cricket sang that on the Disney show, you know? It, and it was fascinating. And so the show would begin and who knows who knows what we would learn next? Well, I also thought of another song that's kind of a, a quest for truth uh, that brings childlike amazement, but it brings childlike amazement to every adult too. Remember this song? The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E, let's do that again. The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. I recall many, many years ago, it was in the 60s, I think, 60s or 70s, how many people remembered Troy Donahue? He was an actor and a good-looking fella when he was young, and uh, he had his own show. And he had a guest on the show, a Christian lady, and the Christian lady made a character called Bernie the Bear. And so Donahue says, well, what's Bernie known for? She says, Bernie is known for telling the truth. And Donahue says, like a good pilot, what is truth? She says, well, just push Bernie's button. So he picks Bernie up, pushes the button, and Bernie starts singing, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. But Donahue pushes the button, and Bernie won't stop singing, the B-I-B-L-E. And now he's, he's gone through two choruses of the B-I-B-L-E, and he's trying the third time to push the button, and all Bernie responds, the B-I-B-L-E. He can't shut that bear up. In his hands, he's got the secret to the truth. It's in the Bible. It's the word of truth which we speak, yes. the Apostle Paul says. It's the word of God. It's the wonder and amazement of the word of God which comes alive in you by virtue of your investment yes. in this word. It's proclaimed out of the mouth of God. 
The words in here will tell you what's true and will tell you what the truth is and it proceeds. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is true and sometimes we just lose sight of how big God is and how big the truth is. When God stood and there was nothing, God opened his mouth and he spoke words and out of God came the creation of the universe. It didn't just happen out there. It happened in God and it came out of his mouth. He spoke the truth and he said, sun, moon, stars exist. And they came out of God. How big is our God? How little are the problems of today? Amen. The problems are little compared to what God has stored up in himself. And he creates this great universe out of himself and then he concludes it's too small for me. He's greater than the universe he created, of course. So who is it that sits on the throne? Let me tell you an exciting story. A man is seated on the throne of God. A man like us. He came as God to become man like us, to return as God and man like us to give an inheritance that he owns. And it's all the truth. A man is seated on the throne of God. Wow. I just have to stop myself and yeah. say la and think about it. How awesome is God? Yes. And he gives this truth by inspiration to men who write it down so I can say la the word and have it come alive in me. And you. Anyone who, God is no respecter of persons. You get it because you want it. You get it because you seek him and you seek his face. But that's the secret. You got one man has to seek God and he gets treasures. But let me tell you the truth about the truth. It can make you uncomfortable at first. The truth, the truth will be the light shining out of darkness and Jesus had a way of presenting parables and stories and characters that people could relate to and it made them a little uncomfortable. But that's good. You gotta make people a little uncomfortable so they have this certainty of changing. Elma and I were talking about this discomfort that Jesus had a way of, of sharing with people. <coughs> but through this discomfort, it shows that there is an, alter an alternative to what we already believe. Here's an example. Jesus told the story of a prodigal son. But actually, there were two prodigals. There was the young reckless son who just had this desire to get out in the world. And there was this faithful son at home, the older son, who had at least as many problems as the younger. But here stands a father between them. Now, who do you relate to in this story? I related to both the younger and the older son. The younger, because I had my day of wanting to see what the world had to offer. And when I found myself just feeding pigs, I woke up. But I was also the older son who was just resentful, maybe a bit entitled, that I deserved more. I relate to that one too. I've, I've gone through both paths. But here's what I could never relate to. A father who is so loving to both sons, he could give all that he had 
to both sons without depleting his wealth and his inheritance and his estate. That's the whole point of the prodigal son is not the sons, it was the dad. Jesus was talking about God, our father, who has total wealth to give all of his children. And yet that wealth is never depleted. Um, I thought, and I thought kind of, kind of uneasily, uncomfortably, about the Good Samaritan. Which character am I? Am I the one who was beaten up, left half dead, robbed, cooking in the Palestinian sun? Or was I one of the religious types who saw a problem but just didn't have the time or didn't want to put the effort in to give help to someone in need? Or do I relate to a Samaritan who was a good man, who took the time to stop and time to help, shared his oil, shared his wine, put a man on a donkey, took him to a, an inn, paid an innkeeper, said take care of him, and if I owe you more, I'll be back. I'm sure as Jesus told that story, people were squirming just a little bit trying to figure out, well, who am I? Which one will I be? Oh, and then there's really the discomfort when they showed Jesus a coin and said, what do you say about taxation? He really made them squirm then if they got it. He said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Okay? Pay your taxes. It's Caesar's money. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But now he drops the hammer and said, now give to God what belongs to God. That really makes them uncomfortable. In other words, if you pay taxes to Caesar, if you obey Caesar and pay his taxes, but you won't pay God his taxes or his tithe, who's your Lord? That's what he's asking. He's saying, who's your Lord? It's the one you obey. I mean, that makes me squirm all over. That's uncomfortable. It puts me right here in the middle of the valley of decision. Who is my Lord? The one I obey. And then both Elmer and I were talking about this little discussion, this sermon, and we both talked about the great discomfort of a prophet named Jonah. Actually, Elmer brought up the subject of Jonah. If you want to be really uncomfortable, get an assignment for God, run away, get on a ship, let God churn up a good storm, and God, who knows about the discomfort he's creating for Jonah, says to a big fish, your assignment is to be at this latitude, this longitude, and I give you an appetite for a prophet. <laughs> Swallow them, but don't kill them. And how uncomfortable must it been to be in the dark belly of a whale with all the digestive juices, eating every hair on your body, and the tunic that you wore, and then get spit out at a certain place at a certain time, naked as a jaybird, most likely, bleached white after three days, in the hot sun, and have people point at you and say, this is unusual. <laughs> what does this unusual man have to say? And he simply said, 40 days and 40 nights, and the judgment of God will fall. And 600,000 or more Assyrians fast and pray and repent of their wicked ways. 
but Jonah's not through. That is his discomfort. So at the end of the story, he complains before God and he says, I knew it. I knew it. God, I knew it. I knew you'd be merciful. He didn't want those Assyrians saved. They're the enemy of Israel. But I know you, God, you're merciful and kind. You're good. You're just. You're compassionate. You just saved our enemies, and I knew you would do it. In other words, he was out of his gourd. And God gave him a gourd to show him how out of his gourd he really is. God saves people, and he doesn't like it. Let me, let me read a majestic, a majestic presentation of this one who is the truth and who saves and creates. John chapter 1. In fact, I'm going to ask you and uh, everyone watching, this week, read repeatedly John chapter 1 for next week and maybe the week after. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All of it. Listen to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Oh, this Word is a Him. Without Him was nothing made that was made. In Him, this Word of truth in him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness couldn't put it out. And this word, him, I'm in 14 now, and this word was made flesh, became a man, dwelt among us, John said, and we beheld his glory. What glory? It was the glory of the only begotten God, our Father. But this one, this word, this one who took on flesh, he was full of grace and truth. Yes, amen. Beautiful. And of his fullness, we have received grace and truth. Now the law was given to us by Moses, but grace and truth was given to us by Jesus. Words like this don't get written every day. These are magnificent words. <clears throat> and they point to the truth of who God really is. Yes. Isaiah 65, 16 says, He is the God of truth. John 1, 17, I just read, The law came, came through Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. We beheld his glory. How did it look? Full of grace and truth. Truth is a man named Jesus. It is, it's his moral essence. It's his character. It's his, it's his makeup. In John 6, 63, the spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. My words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And when Jesus says to the larger crowd, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And the 72 disciples went away and it didn't phase Jesus a bit. He's not a people pleaser. So he says to his 12, uh, boys, you want to go too? Peter says, where would we go? Where would we go? Only you have the words of life. Today, there's a lack of peace in the land because there's a lack of truth. Today, there's confusion in the land because there's a lack of truth. Not in the church. We know it. Or we should know it. Today, these are the days of deception. There are lies covered up with deception today. But 
Proverbs 14, 15 says this, The simple believe every word, but the prudent or the wise man looks well into his going. Look deeper when you hear something today. When the media wants to tell you something, go to the truth and look deeper. Find it. Proverbs 25 20, uh, and 2 says, that it's the glory of God to conceal things, but it's the honor of kings to seek these out. If you want the truth, biblical truth 101 is you have to seek God. You have to seek for the truth. Here are some non-truths, but they're here, that a coronavirus is catchy. Yes, it's easy to catch. That's what they're concerned about. But as you look into it, you can find that the curve they talked about, that death curve, when the church prayed, that death curve was flattened. And now it's concave. Now it's below the line. That we have very few people who are dying of this coronavirus. But you still have to treat it and treat our seniors with respect. Sam's not here because he has a medical condition. Somebody with a medical condition, if they catch a cold, it could be terminal. So out of respect for Sam, I'll do certain things. But I'll still look for the truth, or at least I'll look for the facts, because Right now, the eight major countries that have this coronavirus, the death rate in America is the lowest. It's either seven or eight. It, it might just be the lowest right now. And Scandinavian countries and other countries that did not lock down, but took care of their seniors, did much, much better than the countries that did lock down. It's not as healthy to be confined to quarters. There's deception just, just everywhere, and the facts and the data have been so compromised, I really don't know who to believe, and that's good. Because I'm going back to the B-I-B-L-E. Yes. Yes. What does it say about civil lawlessness when you can't get arrested for a crime in the street, but pastors could be arrested for preaching in a church? What does that say about deception in our land? Somebody's got some ulterior motive. What's with this political far extreme left that used to be progressives but now admit to being a socialist and actually are being called out as social Marxist? Did you ever think the day would come in America where you would see this surface and surface in a, a political party. It's very partisan. This racism issue. What does God have to say about this racism issue? It's become, it's become a, a political issue for some. I would say during these troubled times when there's so much question about race, I would say, turn to Jesus. Yes. Systemic racism? Where do we get these sound bites? Who's feeding that to us? S systemic racism? How come we never heard of that before? Let me recommend systemic truth. Amen. It'll go a long ways. You remember this in Matthew chapter 4. Let's get to the truth about this, shall we? Matthew chapter 4. Jesus fasts in the desert for 40 days. Temptation number one, that rock looks like a good loaf of hot bread. And so the temptation is, turn that rock into bread. You're hungry. And the truth said, Man will not live 
by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's systemic truth. God will give you your bread, but there's something more important, and you will not take your bread from the hand of the devil. God will give it to you. Well, temptation number two. Now he ups the stakes and takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and says, cast yourself down because it is written. He would bear you up lest you would even dash your foot against a stone. You know, it's good to take God at his word, but it is not healthy to have your own vain, egotistical, and proud agenda and ask God to come in and bless it. Yes. It's his agenda. It's his will, not mine. So Jesus dismisses him and said, you will not tempt the Lord your God. Answers him right out of Deuteronomy again. But here it is. This is, this is the temptation. He takes him to an exceeding high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of this world. Kingdoms, plural. He shows them all the kingdoms of this world. And he said, these are mine. And I'll give every one to you. I'll give you all these kingdoms and all the systems within every kingdom. All you have to do is worship me. And that's what the devil really wants. That's the deception of our day. He wants to be worshipped. He craves to have what God has. Jesus answered. And he answers again with scripture. All the kingdoms of the world may belong to Satan. But he's not going to touch one of them. He's here to bring in a kingdom that's far greater than the kingdoms of this world. But I want you to know that the social justice, the racial agenda of the day, is that the will of God for the church today is to know the truth in the face of racial or systemic racism. How did God address these kingdoms? How did Jesus address these kingdoms and what were they? I'm going to go over time. Is that okay? Number one, Jesus had to address the kingdoms of power and might. You see, he had to address Rome. That was the kingdom of power. Israel was occupied. It didn't stop the kingdom of God or the king. But despite Nebuchadnezzar's fourth dream, legs of iron, Rome had an iron fist, and you better do what Rome says if you value your life. And Jesus had to minister in that kingdom, but he did not touch the kingdom. And he didn't, he didn't pose a rebellion against Rome. The Herodians were a kingdom of their, their own. This was the political kingdom of the day. Herod said, if we just cooperate with Rome, we'll number one, be wealthy, we'll be their builders, and through politics, we'll win the day. The kingdom of politics. Fourth, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the kingdom of religion. The devil owns them all. He owns the kingdom of power. He owns the kingdom of politics. He owns the kingdoms of a religion. But he won't touch the ungodly kingdoms of this world. He's got a kingdom of his own that has all the right power, that has all the right religion, that has all the right politics to it. The Pharisees. These are the ones that Jesus probably warned the most because they were using God to justify their position. They were the corporate organized institutional religions of the day. And then there was the kingdom of the zealots. 
You know, the rebels, the rioter. The only good Roman is a dead Roman. And then the kingdoms of the Essenes. They ran off to the hills and caves of Qumran. They were above it all, and they just weren't going to touch all these polluted people. But they contributed nothing to society, except, I have to say, there were some scrolls that were found in those caves. You know why Jesus didn't pose rebellion? He didn't go to war with these kingdoms of Satan? He had a different way of dealing with kingdoms. And all the systems in all those kingdoms, the systemic stuff, he had a way of dealing. Systemic racism, systemic political corruption, systemic economies, and evil systemic finances. Systemic greed is what they are. And they're all part of the kingdoms of Satan. Systemic immorality, the porn, even affecting a billion dollar business, exploiting children, systemic roots of all evil, systemic greed, the desire and the love of money, systemic gambling. Oh, it's condemned if the mob does it, but if we just make a law and call it lottery, it's okay. No, it's systemic, and it's from the wrong kingdom. Systemic false religions, false gods, and made-up prophets. We face all these today. Systemic injustice. Get the right attorney, and you are above the law. Systemic medical profession. And I have a lot of respect for the medical profession, but let me tell you, there's, there's systemic problems when a doctor can violate his hypocritic oath and take the life of a child out of the womb and kill it. Amen. Systemic pharmacology. Look at the addiction in our nation today for profit and greed. Because our systemic courts are split with antichrist decisions. Systemic cultural rebellion against God. Christ and his truth, systemic child abuse, gender confusion, sexual abuses. We're confusing our children because we have a systemic flawed education system that's pushing an agenda on our children that's confusing them about who they are as little boys and little girls. And it's even worse than that. Let me give you the words of Jesus. One day, Anyone who abuses a child will stand before God. And Jesus said, it would be better in that day he were never born at all. Amen. And just because it looks like God's silent, don't you believe it? It says in the Bible, every time there's a great judgment, God is storing up his wrath to come. When evil rises, the wrath of God rises. And evil looks around and says, I guess I can get away with it. I'm, I'll just be a little more evil. The wrath of God quietly meets. Then they go into immorality. They go into perversions. They become vile. Reprobate in mind. Abominable. But the, the wrath of God is raising the whole time. Because God sees everything. And this is what God says. Jesus said, that day will come like a thief in the night. Better be aware. He says, sudden judgment will come like it came in the days of Noah. In minutes. Minutes. It didn't just rain. It poured and it flooded from above. The wrath of God from below the earth didn't just bubble up. It gushed up. In minutes, God cleansed the earth. And we think that God doesn't see systemic racism. Don't play, don't play in the devil's kingdoms. And don't play with the devil's systems. History should teach us there is no good result from playing in the devil's workshop. And what's this, what's this other little buzzword? 
white privilege? Where in hell's kingdom did that come from? Where did that sound bite come? I'll tell you, privilege only comes from God. We have other words for it in the Bible. It's called grace. The grace of God is given to the humble. It's given to the meek. If you want privilege, if you want grace, if you want the favor of God, you don't have to be any color, any creed, any race, any gender. God is no respecter of persons. He will give it generously to everybody. You want privilege? You can have it no matter who you are. You want the grace and the favor of God upon your life? Good. Love God. Know and follow His will. And obey Him daily. And you will get the favor of God. I'll call that Christian privilege. Yes. Amen. Don't let anybody fool you with this nonsense today. In fact, let's be praying for people in the church that we do exactly what Jesus did. He didn't go to war against the evil kingdoms or system. He was too busy presenting the kingdom of God and he as the king of the kingdom. Based on the Bible, the word of faith, the spirit of truth, the word of truth. You have to have a foundation. This, this is our firm foundation upon which the truth is built. And here are some friends of the truth. Trust. Truth will provide a basis for trust. And trust is the building block for every relationship. If I lose my trust in Kim or she loses her trust in me, I will tell you, our marriage is all but gone. You have to trust. Trust is the building block of relationship. And truth is what supports trust. God is a God of relationship. If you don't trust God, I can tell you something about your relationship. Then justice, but it will lead to the love of God, which will bring glory to God, and we'll see the manifestation of Jesus once again, full of grace and full of truth. The glory of God has everything to do with the grace and the truth. Then, the truth will build our faith. Faith comes by hearing, by hearing the word of God. That will make us mature in the Lord. John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them. Grow them up. Mature them with your truth. Thy word, O oh God, is truth. That's how we grow. And we grow into holiness. It's a gift of Jesus that he gives us for being faithful to the truth. And then over here to the left in red is freedom. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. You'll be a free person. You'll be free to have peace with God and peace with one another. Oh, I left out joy, but you'll discover that. In the whole mix, you'll be a joyful person. You'll be a happy, well-adjusted person. And the truth will take the clouds of the day and disperse them. So the bright light of the Son of God will shine through. Jesus never messed with these other kingdoms. He was too busy defeating them with the truth. Amen. Hey, let me tell you. Rome is gone. The Caesars have gone. But Jesus and his truth and his church still remain. Amen. Yes. Every ungodly kingdom, gone. Every system has been judged and is just waiting for the fulfillment of Peter's insight, a prophetic insight, where it will all burn up in a fervent heat one day. Jesus already defeated all this with the truth. Don't buy into anything and lift up your voice and be a trumpet and tell people, other people, don't be faked out today. The truth still prevails.
Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day, but we thank you for your word, and your word is truth. We ask, Lord, that you would cause each of us to be introspective, that we would find the power of the truth in each and every one of us, and we would see ourselves as the light of God shining in a dark world, and this is the time where the fields and the earth is white and ripe for harvest. Amen. Amen. Amen.